All right. Hello, everybody. Welcome, welcome. Uh, I got this in the mail yesterday, the Book of Gob. And I thought, what a what better thing to do today. Let me see if I can hold this. There we go. From Lost Pages. Really nice looking book. I'd heard a lot of good things about it. Obviously, I'd never read it until now. And I, you know, this was paid for me by through my own monies and through Patreon and folks who support me in that way. So thanks everybody allowing me to get this. I think I'm just realizing, I think I forgot to add a link to this in the show notes. I don't think you can get this on drive through. I think I got it through. I might have gotten it through Lost Pages directly. I want to say I looked at it for an exalted funeral. They didn't have it in stock. It was out of stock, but I was able to get it. And it comes with music, some kind of soundtrack, which I don't have. I think maybe I can download it. I just haven't downloaded it yet. It didn't come with anything physical. The book. And and we're going to go through the book. And, of course, you get the book physically and also the PDF, which I'm going to switch to momentarily. But I thought if you kind of wanted to see the book, it's got one of these nice – I don't even know what to call it. I need to get better on the terms of what you call these different – covers but it's it's almost like a knit uh, knit's probably not the right right word but and and this is sort of it's slightly embossed i guess on the cover i don't know if you can see it it's very nice and inside is this kind of zine format the the type not the largest type but fairly 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 nice and it's uh it's big so anyway this is what it looks like and it's nice to have a nice Hard cover, and you know, folks in the OR sp- or OSR space love their physical books. Oh, I think it also has a ribbon too, which I always appreciate. It looks like there's a ribbon, or is there something? Yes, there is indeed a ribbon to hold to keep your page. I gotta take the train this afternoon, so maybe I'll, depending on how much we get through today, I might make use of this ribbon because I hate. I'll just say this: I hate bending, bending pages. It. it it makes me cringe. My daughter, the, my my uh, my wife likes to do that. My daughter likes to do that. Holding, you know, keeping their page by creasing a page corner. And oh, it, ooh, it hurts my very soul. All right, let's uh, let's switch to the other thing. Switch to the other screen so I can show the PDF. Here we go. Whoop, whoop. There we go. Am I in frame? All right. Hey, Brian Smith. Hey, Frederick. I don't know what to call it. I, I, to be honest, it's it's one of the things, right? What is the Book of Gob? It's hard to say. I know it's got something to do with magic. I know it also has something to do with poetry. So you know, I riffed on that in terms of the, in terms of the the title. I just kind of riffed on that. I, I there's a lot I don't know about this book actually. It's just a swig of watered down apple cider for the working man. So I think this is going to be a little bit of a discovery. The back of the book. Features some verse, and I suppose to get us in the mood, might as well read it. A finger trails the letters across a dusty tome. A finger points the way down a dark, haunted alley. A finger feels for the pulse of life on a long, decayed corpse. A finger scratches the floorboards beneath your feet. A finger chewed down to a white bone. A finger that is not there. A finger catches a shed tear and slides it into a bottle. These are the seven fingers of the hand of Gob. And you see here, you may, may or may not have noticed, but there are definitely more than five fingers on this particular hand. Paul Drury calls it a grimoire, a dark magic tome. Yeah, those work too. Those work too. So let's get into it. Let's see what dark magic we have here. All right, I just read that. Ooh, I like the... So here we have another illustration. It reminds me a little bit of uh, Stranger Things, but this is a, a hand, but it's got... The fingers elongate to make it almost look like spider or something, arachnoid. The hand of Gob is an oft felt but rarely seen presence, the filigree silk of cobwebs, the chilling breath of autumn's first winds. Some believe they can bend the hand to their whims to extend their reach through and beyond the cracks of the world. You are one of them, dear reader, one to whom fear and taboos are only foolish tales to limit the search for power. You did not heed the warnings. You should have listened. All right. I don't know if I signed up for all that, folks, but, you know, if uh, I suddenly disappear in a in a, a chilling wind, then you'll know you'll know who to blame. So we have the introduction. The Book of Gob is a collection of 49 micro fictions and spells without levels in the style of wonder, wonder and wickedness and marvels and malazans. 
also published by Lost Pages. I'm, you know, more things I've heard of that I haven't had a chance to read yet. I hope that is not something where I should have read those first before coming here. We're just going to go with it because potentially other folks out here didn't haven't aren't familiar with those and, and grabbed this book. The spells are accompanied by catastrophes, paraphernalia, monsters, and adventure hooks. The, the contents are presented in a mostly system neutral manner available to anyone who wishes to tempt fate by taking the hand of Gob. Where to find Gob spells? We have a D10 table. I'll read through these, but you know, I'm gonna be I'm gonna be choosy in what I pick because there's a lot here, as we can see from that table of contents. About a hundred pages more or less of stuff. I'm not gonna be able to get through all that in an hour. And I probably would be insane for me to try. But in terms of where to find your gob gob spells, they might be carved into the bottom of a long abandoned steamer trunk, burned in the dark, appearing letter by letter, pr pressing on your closed eyes for long enough. That's a cool one. Read from live entrails. You must read quickly. Upon death, they will disappear. Decoded from the symbology of a dying insomniac sleep-deprived hallucinations. Replacing the memories lost to repeated trepanning. Eww. Whispered into your ear after tossing your severed finger into a barren wishing well. well. That's colorful. Nailed to a mile marker at a crossroad with no signs. At sunrise, they'll be gone. On the inside of your pet turtle shell. Hidden in the old curving blueprints of abandoned sewers. In a forgotten mausoleum, listening to the muffled whispers coming from the floor where nobody should be burned. So these are very flavorful, <laughs> if not necessarily practical. But hey, we're talking about magic here. So practicality is a by far not our main concern. But they're very definitely get a good, a good flavor of kind of what's going on here. And uh, though, I, you know, some of these seem like they might be really hard to get in your campaign. I think they give you an idea of the kind of weird and dark and grim sort of methods that gob magic might be accessed. The fingers of gob. The hand of gob has seven fingers. The finger that finger trailing the letters, the finger that points the way, the finger on the pulse, the finger under the floorboards, the finger nod to the bone, the finger that is not there, the finger catching a tear. And let's see, we've got some more tables here. Are they tables? Well, they're they're D6, they're they're seven of these. Mm, let's see. All right. I think you know what I'm gonna read because I thought maybe it was uh like Missouri and the Magician by Jack Vance. Let's see. I'm going to read. I thought these descriptions were basically the a re repetition of the poetry, but I guess not. So let me read through. So the finger trailing the letters. Gently turns a page, and then another, and then another. It digs into the parchment, and the parchment digs back, etching thin lines into the flesh where it breezes past. This finger knows too much. The finger that points the way traces the nerves of a map, drawing the ends of roads past the parchment and ink. It alone among the fingers, it is alone among the fingers, and it likes it that way. The finger on the pulse draws the scalpel across the flesh of the patient. The body was human, but it is now the patient. It does not hear the screams, for it has no ears. It's a finger. That makes sense. The finger under the floorboards is boarded up in the cellar. You can hear it knock, knock, knock on that chained and bound door, but you dare not let it out. The finger gnawed to the bone is stuck in a juicy meat pie laden with sauce, drippings, and fat. It suckles and scratches and bites. Someday it will have its fill, but you won't be around to see that. The finger that is not there does not, will not, and has not existed ever. The finger catching a tear lingers for a moment upon the cheek of a lover, drawing a thin gash into the flesh as it retreats. It tugs on that bright red heart string and pulls it hard, but it has many such strings wrapped around it, straining to get away. Ryan Smith asks, what about that finger that goes wah, wah, wah all the way home? <laughs> A lot of fingers going on here. So I'm not sure what these tables for are on the opposite page. Again, there are seven fingers and we get seven choices here. I'm not sure how we would roll on these. Is there a, does DCC have a D7 die we can borrow for this? So the so I guess I'll just let me read. Um, I guess uh, which finger should I read? Uh, let's see which one. Okay, so the finger nod to the bone under this table. I'm guessing it's a table. It says flysite, pachymagog, pamphagus, fistula, fractal flensing, helminthiasis, and orgiophant. Now these sound like these may be the spells. So maybe there are seven spells for each of the seven fingers. Which makes sense. I guess we'll see. 
Brian Smith says, uh, point at a calendar randomly and use that day of the week for a D7. Yeah, I, I guess if you can if, if you can actually literally make it truly random. I mean, you can look, you could use a any kind of online tool to do it. I'm guessing maybe that what this really is, is there are going to be seven spells, one seven spells for each finger. And that's why they're one through seven, which, you know, thematically seven fingers, seven spells. And I think that's right, since we're going to get into some spells. So I don't know how to determine which spells to read and which ones skip over. Which ones sound good to us? Digital, there's digital allegotrophy. Allegotrophy, what is that? I'm guessing that's a word. Can I, it doesn't show me. Okay, I can't, I can't quickly check inside this PDF reading app what that means. Well, let's just read it. Digital allegotrophy. Seven knuckles for seven fingers, seven blood samples for seven inks, seven skulls for seven vials, seven bones for seven pens, seven pens for seven books, seven bestsellers to show that bastard he was wrong. Scribbles found on a shred of loose leaf in a nameless pauper's grave. Cast a spell on one of your hands. It painfully, go it painfully grows long tendril-like fingers up to a total of seven, each having seven phalanges. Each finger, each finger can independently perform the task of a hand by itself, such as writing or holding an item. Every knuckle pops and cracks loudly when moved, making tasks requiring manual dexterity very noisy. Okay, so. Cast a spell on your hands. I'm guessing all this stuff is permanent because we're not getting any kind. I mean, some of these maybe I'll have durations. This one does not. So I presume you cast it and that's it. It's the interesting thing with this stuff, right? And this is where I can get caught up and you guys will have to keep me. Let me know if I'm going down too many <laughs> rabbit holes, but I'm always looking at this in terms of maybe more than I should in some kind of technical sense, right? Well, how long does this last? How long? Like these are very, I guess, part, and, and it makes sense because they're system agnostic or trying to be system neutral that they're not giving you a lot. So I'm going to take each one of these as I'm going to take these paragraphs as, as they are. Right? I'm not assuming, I'm not going to assume any framework if they don't provide it. So if they don't tell me, for example, digital allegotrophy says cast a spell on one of your hands. So I'm presuming you cannot cast it on somebody else's hands. And I'm presuming that you, uh, I suppose you could cast it on both your hands if you wanted to. Now, could you cast it on your hands more than once? I don't know. Are these multiples of seven? Maybe you could, maybe you can't, I think given that these are going for a lot of flavor over maybe clarity or at the expense of clarity, I would probably say you can only cast this on yourself twice. So I probably wouldn't want to, you know, memorize the spell for a lot, but, you know, cast it in a ritual. If you have rituals, cast it from a scroll, I suppose. Paul Drury says, this is not really gameism or simulation. It's, it's narrative narrativism. Yes. So that's what we have to look at. So the one thing, it's really going to be game to group dependent in terms of if you were to pick up this book and grab these spells or make them available at your table, what you'll need to add to them, if any. Some of them, like this spell is probably fairly clear just from the context of, hey, you can only cast it on yourself. Probably can only cast it once on each hand. It's permanent. Done. And, and the effect itself, though weird... It's kind of self-explanatory. Each of your fingers can act, of these new fingers, can act as a hand. Okay, fairly easy. Some of these other ones might get more complicated, but uh, you know they work. And if your if your if your table can just run with that, then you can run with it. If they can't, then you might need want to pre-read, pre-prep some of these. If you're going to drop one in your game, you know, just think about read through it. I mean, you should always read through something before you just drop it in your game. But these in particular, you might need to read through it because depending on your players, some of them, some players really like or really require things to be spelled out and you'll want to spell it out for them. Other players will take it and, and just run, right? So know your know your party, know your table before you drop things in, which I guess is the rule for everything. So it's not particular to this. Okay, so let's see what other one. Mendacia Mortua. All right, so we'll try this one. So Mendacia... Mortua says, it interests me to find the most common lie in every language. Of course, there are banal, everyday deceptions like, I am fine, or 
I love you, taking up the first dozen or so slots, as with any other language. But the deeper ones are more telling of what went wrong in their society. The you can trust me or the countless oaths sworn on this, that, or the other thing. So I was surprised to find that the single most common lie spoken in that lost language was, dear child, this shall not hurt one bit. <laughs> Paul Drury said, Vance's spells are highly evocative titles. Yes, Paul Drury, but the difference is, is you, that Vance was not writing them to be manipulated by a bunch of people. They only had to fit his story. It's very easy in a work of fiction to not worry about the rules. Not saying that Vance didn't, some folks like Tolkien authors were very conscious of the rules and kind of mechanics of their worlds and this and that. But of course, they can be descriptive because they're only going to work in the way that he wants it to work for the story. When you throw it in a game, you know, if I was playing a game, like let's say I was playing a game at a, at a gaming store and I wanted to use this, I'd have to think very carefully about all the – or at least consider – the vast different amount of people that might come to my open table. And if I throw this in front of some players, they're going to react one way. If I throw some other players, they're going to react another one. So yeah, in terms of the fiction, that's great. But this isn't just a work of fiction, right? It's also a game book. So I just bring it up is to be aware of it. It's not a it's not a good thing or bad thing. It's, it's a really a, a style thing. But I think if some folks look at it and say, oh, it's system agnostic. I just throw up my game and go, eh, you know, you might need to, might need to, might need to uh, give it a read. I mean, like I said, you know, Everything you should give a read. And if you picked it up on, what was that, uh, D&D Wiki, you should just not give it a read. Just throw it out because D&D Wiki is awful. So here's the sp actual spell. Pick a dead, non-magical language you have been exposed to. You gain perfect fluency in that language in all its written and spoken forms, but you can only speak or write falsehoods in it. You can also detect lies in that language. You do not directly learn the truths beneath the lies. Aha. Uh -huh. Okay, so this is a kind of a cool one. I like this one a lot. So you, it's got to be a dead language, but it's not magical. And you have to have been exposed to it. And, of course, you can decide what that means, what exposure means. Did you just see it written on a wall? Obviously, it's a dead language, so probably people aren't speaking it, but maybe you saw it written in some fashion. So you get to you have perfect fluency in it and written and spoken. So you got you got the whole shebang, but you can only <laughs> speak or write lies in it, which is kind of super interesting. It can also, and then you can also detect lies in that language, but you do not directly learn the truth beneath the lies. So, for example, in that dead language, when they learn, dear child, this shall not hurt one bit, you don't know what that means. You don't know what the truth beneath that means. You don't know why that's a lie or what truth that lie is hiding. You just know it's a lie. So that's really intriguing. It's, it's, it's super situational, which I kind of like. I kind of like that. This is not a spell that's going to be super impactful on a session to session basis. You could probably go a long ways in a campaign before it might even ever come up that a dead non-magical language pops onto the scene in some form. And I, because of that, I would probably be pretty open to what it means to be exposed to it. So, for example, I might say hieroglyph if we were doing some kind of ancient Egyptian thing, hieroglyphics in a tomb, that's exposure, right? Or, the you know, the well, I don't know, Rosetta Stone might not work because it actually has modern languages on there. I'm not sure how that works, but it might for the ones that are no longer spoken. So very cool, but it's also very limited because you know this language, you're going to be able to read and write it, but you can only speak or write falsehoods in it. The interesting thing is if you're just trying to read it, can you translate it? I guess you should be able to translate it, right? Because you're not then speaking it in because if you're translating, you're speaking truths, but you're not speaking truths in that language. You're speaking truths in your native tongue or at least your common language with your allies and party members. But you can't read or write it or you can't write it or speak things that are true in it. Which is it's interesting and strange. <laughs> Roger Gork says, fireball. It is what it is. That's very true. Let's hit another one. And I got to be careful here because I don't want to just stick to one because these are very dense. So I want to make sure I'm getting some, at least a couple from all the fingers. So maybe I'll go to another finger. Famigerate. These names are great. Victorious Curse, Oculated Speech, Hypochondria. Oh, it's a healing spell. That one's a long one. Oh, no, that's, sorry, there are two spells. Hypochondria is one. <laughs> well, the illustration is great. And then the other one's Mo Moklik Remedy. 
Brian Smith says, I think you got to read this with little to no mechanical analysis. Yes, this is true. But, you know, I can't help it because I always look at it and say, well, how would I use this in my game? Right. So that's my default. My default thing when I'm reading these things is, ooh, this is cool. If I was going to put this in my homebrew, my, you know, my B and X, B, B and X, B, X homebrew game tonight or tomorrow or whatever my session, like what would I need to do? How, how much, how quickly and easily can I slot this in? So I do kind of come at it with this perspective, which I hope is useful to people. Because not everyone, I would say most people are not, I would say, playing a game where you could just take this and dump it in and, and not think of anything. You might not need to write everything down and take super notes, but I mean, I think you'd want to at least consider some of these things. Let me know if you guys, if, you, if, if those folks who have taken either this or something like it and just run with it kind of as written, I mean, you can do that, right? You can and just cover roll dice around whatever things come up as they come along. But I kind of find it helpful to analyze it. Maybe that's a a fault, a fault in my stars, so to speak. Oh, look at that. I just noticed a really clever little, really clever. So here you can see the fingers. And when I swamp, did I already swamp fingers? I didn't notice. Oh, I did. And I didn't even notice it. Or are they fingers? Hold on a minute. So we went through these. Okay, so, oh, that's really clever. I could probably use it to be a little more obvious when you switch over, but see where they have, so around each page is, and I'll be curious what they do when you get to the, the missing finger. They have the uh, a, a sort of illustration of the hand, and the finger that you're on, I'm guessing, is is made slightly darker, shaded, than the other fingers. So you can kind of look at it and, yeah, I, I mean, it wouldn't be. I, I don't think it would be bad to have a text cue also. But if you look at it and say, "Oh, now we've swapped to the next finger," pretty cool, pretty slick. I probably would put. Oh, it does have it here, so it is there. But then on subsequent pages, you're just going to get that. All right, so we're on finger two. So I can read one of these. Which one should I read? Okay, so let's see. How about famigerate? I received the letter the other day. It was a postcard addressed from my father with the names of two streets from my hometown printed on the reverse. I only moved a few hours north, and I hadn't seen my father for some time, so I decided to make a day of it. When I arrived, I found the address was not, in fact, inside the town as I had remembered, but rather on the outskirts. As the houses thinned and the pavement dried up, I came across an old crossroads, the sign there still bare wood with the street names carved into it by hand. Underneath, a patch of ground had been upturned, something metallic inside the pit catching the light. Brushing the dirt aside, I realized that it was an old silver ring wrapped around a cow's decaying finger. My stomach churned as I knew that ring well. I could still remember the feeling as he ruffled my hair that one time he finally came out to watch my game. Ooh, a little grisly there. All right, so the actual spell is write your sigil and the target's name on a piece of paper, then throw it away. Tomorrow, it will somehow arrive at the target, bearing your exact location in writing. Alternatively, you can cast the spell by writing an exact location on a piece of paper, then tossing it away. You will find the piece of paper tomorrow, reporting the most important rumor or event that occurred there today. Oh, now this one. Well, I mean, look, I, I say this one's good like the other ones weren't good. Oh, this. Man, I like that one. Oh, well, it's funny. I like it a lot. I don't know if I would use it in my campaign, but I like it a lot. The idea of uh, the sigil and the target's name, throw it away, tomorrow, right? That's, I mean, they're both cool. They're both cool things. And the interesting thing here, too, I'm just now catching up on. I, I mean, it said at the beginning, and I just, it kind of just went right by me, right? No spell levels. So I guess these are for everybody, or alternatively, you just have care as to how you want to figure it out. This one seems particularly powerful in day to day usage. I'll have to go back and find those other books because I'm curious to how they handle spells. Obviously, at low levels, it's not a huge deal because if your magic user only has one spell in a day and they decide to, to, to spend it on this, then hey, well done, right? Because it's it's some strong stuff, but it's not crazy strong. It's not uh, it's not it's probably not as strong situationally as a sleep or charm person, other first level spells. But man, it's got a lot of utility. Once you've got a few levels and you got some extra spell slots, I would totally, if I wasn't in a dungeon, I mean, I'd be using this all day long for getting stuff. Now, the the the, the I guess the uh, 
the key with the second one, which is probably the one that I would want to use most of the time, because if I didn't have a specific message, is this. It's rumor or event that occurred that day. So rumor, to me, this, to me, the fact that they signal a rumor or event means that there is the potential that it's false. Not necessarily a lot, like not deceptive, but there can be rumors that can be untrue. You know, I heard that the Duke died in his sleep. Okay, he didn't. It's just, it was rumor, it's not true. So rumor or event, I think, gives the GM a little bit of wiggle room because otherwise that would make it even more powerful if you could literally have this thing of like, okay, I'm going to write a location. I'm going to be over here, but I'm going to throw the, I'm going to throw this away and it's going to tell me everything that happened. I mean, think about the places you could cast that. If you had an audience with the Duke and you were able to toss that and then you know you have a chance to come back and say, all right, I'm going to be able to come back to the castle to find it. So tell me how this happened in the Duke's throne room today. I mean, boom. That's, I mean, one is a GM. This is kind of cool because it's just plot hooks galore. You could really have a lot of fun. I always love these spells that kind of give the players information because that information itself is just enriching enriching the campaign, adding new dimensionality to the campaign, adding new potential directions to the campaign. So I don't look at it like, oh, it's being something's being spoiled. I look at it like, ooh, yeah. And then you can think about, well, what? Maybe something happened partly in the throne room, but not all the way in the throne room so that the party will get some information, but there'll be some gaps. And of course, the fact that it could be a rumor means that it doesn't necessarily have to be true or not 100% true. So, I, you know, you could play around a little bit. Cool, cool, cool. Let's see. We got Roblet, Victorious Curse, Oculated Speech, Disarcinate, Disarcinate. All right, let's try Disarcinate. Why not? And if you guys have spells in here because you're familiar with the book, and you, uh, which would mean you're more familiar than I, that you think are particularly good, shout them out and I'll try to read it. Or if you see me flipping through pages, and there's a spell that you see come up on the screen that you think deserves attention, then, you know, let me know. I'm here for you. All right, this is called this Disarcinate. When the good doctor first answered the call of one Mr. Gabriel, we had arrived at his home to find his body lying statue-like in his rocking chair. He was thoroughly ancient by appearance, though his file had said he was a mere 34 years of age. I confirmed his pulse, fearing he was deceased, when I felt a sickening chill upon my back. I only barely, barely made out a bright flash of light when suddenly Mr. Gabriel's pulse had started up again, and he was miraculously awake. I can only assume it was the amazing work of the good doctor, as we weren't called to that home for many weeks after. Ooh, the good doctor. But what does this actually do? This spell detaches your soul from your body, making it manifest as a shadow while the spell lasts. Meanwhile, your body will be left behind almost dead, your heartbeat barely there, yet yearning for your soul. In the shadow, meanwhile, you can creep along walls, ceilings, and floors and pass through any space or crack a shadow could fit. If the shadow is exposed to intense light or when the spell terminates and you are not back in a body, your soul is flung back into your own body. And wait, hold on. So if the shadow is exposed to extreme to intense light, okay, got that, or when the spell terminates and you are not back in a body, so, all right, I guess we'll have to see if there's a, some meaning behind that. Your soul is flung back into your own body. The sudden stress deals you 1d4 damage per exploration turn spent as a shadow. So there you get a little mechanic there, right? Exploration turn. They could have said 10 minutes, but exploration turn is a little bit more agnostic system-wise. To avoid this painful problem, make sure to creep back to your body before the spell ends. As a shadow, you can attempt to possess a nearby creature. Okay, that's what we're talking about. The victim must save or have their soul forcibly ejected from their body. Should you find yourself in a different different body when the spell ends, that body is now yours forever, and you won't be pulled back to the body you left behind. The fate of the victim's disembodied soul is grim. The miserable experience of a shadow will bear down on them, and if they are unable to find a soulless body to occupy, they will eventually become an anguished poltergeist. So this one, in terms of the description, I might like the best, not because it's the most flavorful, but just because I feel like it gives you the most hooks so we can see, okay, you have these things you could do. You have some idea of how long you can do it. Though you don't get a full, it doesn't say, so here's the interesting thing, right? It doesn't say how long, because we know there's a time limit because it says if you're not back in your own body when the spell expires, things happen. 
but we don't know when that happened. So we don't know when this, how, or when the spell terminates. I mean, I suppose there's good old dispel magic would do the trick. And I would imagine you could maybe even cast that on the body. I, I would think that would work. Maybe in some of those other books, they give you some idea of spell casting, but that's the only thing that's missing is, well, how long, how long does it last? Because clearly you could be out there for multiple multiples of like 10 minutes. So would an hour be too much? Would you say it a day? I don't know. I guess you got to figure it out. Roll dice, I suppose. Being able to possess nearby creatures is, is, is very cool, but of course dicey because if the spell ends and you're in that other creature, it's yours. Now that could be good or bad because we have no concept here. Here's where you, maybe the first time, I guess, as well as I like this description that I just said, but here's the thing where you, you I can see a possible abuse. Very powerful creatures. Could you just shadow yourself and just try to try to, try to uh, attach to their bodies? Like, okay, dragon, you're a first level first level magic user and you cast this and you do you pull up bilbo or and you 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 but using your shadow and you slide into smog's lair and he's not going to make any noise could you just attempt to possess them and if you succeed you've got smog's body i don't know and then i like the idea that if you don't make it back in your body or if you when you have kicked out some other soul and they don't make it back in a body like what happens i i i think i would probably use a shadow instead of a poltergeist because i just shadows just a little bit stronger if you're using kind of your default bx shadow but really cool and flavorful really interesting now granted dragons and things will have very strong saves but there doesn't seem to be any penalty to trying and it doesn't seem like the shit like the dragon I suppose if you're using spell casting dragons, which most of us are, then they might be able to dispel or otherwise do something to you. But there's a lot of critters and people who won't have much defense against that. So it's pretty interesting. All right, you got hypochondria. We already saw Mokalic remedy, the artuate. Did I miss? Okay, so that was the last one, last page. Oh, that was the first page. So disarnate, disarsinate was the first spell of the third finger. Yeah, that was one of the finger on the pulse. We're still on finger on the pulse. Finger under the floorboards. We have ambula, hold on, ambulobula. I also like that each spell is encapsulated on a page. Good job on that. It's just nice. It's just neat. You just, you just, you can just know that everything's on that page. You don't have to look around for it. I cast eyes. Let's see this one. I cast eyes. The star attraction of the Circus Bohemia was the haunted house. The rest of it was merely a set of complicated signposts pointing at that kitschy miniature manor. I heard they had a house of mirrors once, but no more. It was not what uh, les gens want to see, a retired acrobat had told me in Meutre sur Chaise, where she worked the belts now. They want the pictures. Inside the maison, it is like a newspaper collage. Horrible things. The maître, he made them. More and more. He had no bed. Instead, at night, he would go into the ghost house. And when we look for him, he wasn't there. One day, he is gone. Disparu. I go into the house to look for him. I see the pictures. They have changed. In each one, there is a bone. From the frayed edges came creatures. The creatures, mon ami, hell lives skin deep under a photograph. Ho, ho. Paul Drury asks, are there others, any other spell books like this? Well, there are two that they say they're using the, let me see, hold on. So I don't have to drop pages back. They mentioned two that are also from Lost Pages, which are, uh, let's see, Wonders and Wickedness and Marvels and Malazons. So basically from the introduction, which you may have missed, was this book is a collection of 49 micro fictions and spells without levels in the style of wonder and wickedness and marvels and malazons. So those, those two books are also available. I don't know how similar they are to this in terms of formatting layout style, whatever, cause I ha haven't read them, but now I definitely want to, but if you have this or you like this and you're looking for where can I get more those might be, those two books might be where I might first look. So I was on I cast eyes. Okay. 
The spell hides you in a painting, photograph, or other static image while the spell lasts. You cannot take the place of any people already in the painting and must remain at least partially visible in it. By cutting one exploration turn from the spell's duration, you may gain any additional ability from this list. And here we have some bullet points. You can either move freely in the picture, gain a sense of hearing, speak from the image, move to another picture in sight, or appear clothed fittingly for the image. While in the image, you can see the locations where the painting is exhibited, but also feel there is a place behind you, a place where bad things live. If the image is defaced or destroyed with you in it, you are sent to that place, a dark shadow of the same picture, where anyone else has worm pale hides, razor teeth, and no eyes. If you are the only person in the painting, things that are not people will emerge instead. In either case, they will tear you apart and eat you. Yeah, so basically you're dying. <laughs> a really grim colorful flavorful doom so but it, it's interesting this spell also suggests or not suggests it says there's a duration but doesn't give you any idea what the duration should be i would probably say here would be my thing maybe 1d6 plus the level of the caster in turns or maybe one i know that's wait a minute 1d6 plus the level of the spell you use to cast it in turns or you could even do maybe d6 per so if you were a high level magic user you could end up at say 8d6 so you could do it for a long time brian smith says high price to pay to just hang out in a nice landscape ah oh, hang out oh, i get you oh yeah brian <laughs> chill on a nice Cezanne. yeah but there's that you see that darkness behind the paint might not seem so chill I, it certainly it could be there's look uh, a, a lot of cool uses in in if i'm gonna do a little bit of spoiling of dungeons and dragons it was honor among thieves but there's a bit where they use a painting in a totally different way to get into a secure location imagine you do that with this get in the painting painting gets moved somewhere or hey you're in the dukes you have a tour of the dukes dukes castle and he's got paintings oh this or that and so you are able to say slip away from the main group cast yourself into a painting, hide in a little corner somewhere, night falls, everyone goes to sleep, out you pop from the painting. Really lots of cool things. And of course, there's always just something's happening. Somebody's attacking the inn or, or you're, uh, you know, you have a painting on the wall, hide into it. It'd be cool to, I mean, I think I can imagine maybe keeping a small painting with me specifically for that. If I want to say sleep safely somewhere, this is where I might do that. This would depend on the duration, right? Because obviously, if it's the duration's three hours, I couldn't sleep in it. But imagine if you were someone who, like me, at times might be a little bit paranoid that folks are coming to get me <laughs> in a in a public location. So imagine you're staying at the local inn, and you put a little painting up on the wall, and then you bounce yourself into the painting. And maybe the painting is like a little portraiture, so it's just you anyway, and you sit there in the portrait. If anybody comes to stab you like a like a uh, in in the night like a nazgul you're not there but then you just hop out now, of course that only works if the the duration's longer than you're likely to sleep whatnot but there's some really interesting tricks you can do with that but as i've appreciated about these spells they're mostly very situational very powerful to do certain things but they also have really good drawbacks which is something i also like because they're taking away the limitations in terms of this isn't a fourth level spell or a third level spell. It's spell. It's it's levelless. So I think having costs kind of in the spell because you're not necessarily paying those costs in your spell slot is important. And all of these seem to have some kind of twist or some kind of really nasty thing that could happen if you abuse the spell and get caught, which is good because that's kind of what right. That's I think I like that part about magic. It should should be a little bit risky. It should be a little bit you're tangling with things beyond your control. Ryan Smith says, if the Nazgul draws a mustache on your portrait, though, you get eaten by hell beasts. Yes, well, that's the thing. They can't know that you're using that spell. It works until somebody knows, and then, but that's kind of the irony that often happens in those stories. I could just, I could read the Vance story or the uh, Clark Ashton Smith or some story like that where that's totally what happens, where someone's using it to hide, using this to hide, and then some kid comes in with a crayon or someone comes in and defaces it, and then they get eaten by the drawing i mean you could see it happening right it makes sense so i would totally be down with that that would be a very uh fitting fitting end okay we're uh 
We're on the floorboard, under the floorboard still. Oh, here we go. So now we're on to the fingered nod to the bone, which now has... Oh, no, it's the next one that does it. Sorry. I'm not at the, the gone finger yet. All right, so this is the... This is, now we're under finger that nod to the bone. This spell is called fly sight. Professor MacArthur's lecture was the talk of the town. It was rare that we had such a celebrated archaeologist visit our quaint con country. I had secured a front row ticket through an old fraternity contact who assured me that I would not be dismayed for he knew well of my amateur delight in the old and unusual. The professor, a practical looking man in tweed, began his lecture with a quote from the descent of Inanna. A fly spoke to holy Inanna. If I show you where Damuzi is, what will be my reward? Inanna said, if you tell me, I will let you frequent the beer houses and taverns. I will let you dwell among the talk of the wise ones. I will let you dwell among the songs of minstrels. He blinked. And I knew that the fly dwelt among the wise. So there's a little, I guess, little bit of fiction, and the, the but the spell itself is: your eyes become a swarm of black flies. You can direct them toward up to one host per caster level. The flies will try to crawl into the host's ears and noses, and from there to their pupils, letting you see everything the hosts see for as long as the flies remain in their eyes. Each host is allowed a save to avoid the effects of the spell, unless they are asleep or restrained. The hosts are only indirectly aware of the invasion. The only hints being itchy eyes and a sly yet persistent buzzing nobody else can hear. As the spell ends, the flies crawl out of the eyes, flying back to you, becoming your eyes again. Ooh, boy. <laughs> you know, I'm thinking of like all the, all the, the man. So here's what I first thought of. Okay, so it's sleeping, right? So they get a save unless they're asleep or restrained. So what am I thinking right away of here? We're back at the inn. You want to send out some spies. Everyone goes to bed. And you're up late at night and you cast this out and send your flies amongst the people sleeping at the inn. And see it per the spell, at least if we're just taking it as written, not allowed to save if they're asleep. So you're just you're in. And of course, there's that whole thing going back to my smog example, because, you know, in BX and earlier editions, especially the white box, I think in AD and E2, there's always that chance of dragons asleep. So the dragons asleep, you can just crawl. <laughs> all your flies in there obviously you don't get to take over the dragon but you get to see through their eyes and ears but i can just see with just some townsfolk being able to like, do that having somebody a hireling or somebody you trust kind of watching you making sure housekeeping doesn't come in and then you could send out your spies basically just out there imagine the tavern keeper the bartender and you get to see through his eyes of course they might think they're going slightly nuts so it's not perfect but super cool but of course, you have no eyes while your eyes are out there, which means you either got to stay in one place or somebody guide you. You're very vulnerable while you're doing this. So yeah, you know, there's a price. And you can't force the hosts to see things that you want to see. There's no mind control. So if the you take over somebody and they go decide to go to sleep or go to a gambling house or sit in the bathroom and, and read the papers for hours on end, you don't, you know, that does, doesn't, but it doesn't work. You don't have any control over it, but potentially powerful. Also thinking of, imagine that you went into a, you know, you went to a, a cave of chaos or something and you, you have a couple of spells handy. So you cast sleep on a bunch of goblins. Then you take some of those goblins, maybe all of them, depending on how many were there, cast this spell on you and then let them just go about their daily business. And you could map out their, at least their area of the caves. You could see how they interact with the other creatures in the caves. If you can do it, really powerful. But of course, these things take setups, which I like, right? It's not an insta-win kind of thing. Like, oh, I just get to get all this information. I'm going to have to figure it out. I'm going to have to plan my plot around this. It's a great tool, but you got to try to figure it out. And while you're using it, you as the kind of play, spellcaster are kind of stuck. So you, you don't you as the player even too have to realize if I send this out for hours and we're doing stuff as a party, I'm going to be blind during that time. And if something happens, I might need to pull, call them back before I get what I want because maybe we're under attack or something's happened, whatever's going on. My right, so it says, imagine going in for an eye exam and they turn into a swarm of black flies. How embarrassing. Yes. Or here's the other one, Brian Smith. Imagine you go for an eye exam and they find a black, one of those little flies sitting in your eyes. Talk about getting creeped out. 
All right, so we're on to so we're so that was part of finger knot of the bone. We're still on finger knot of the bone. Let's see, fractal fractal flensing, orgia font. Okay, now we're on to the finger that is not there, which when we're on that section. They do get a little highlight, even though not there. Now it's there. So this one, abessive form. We've got visamnesium, visamnesium, cartillary nightmare. All right, let's do cartillary nightmare, but maybe I'll do two here because I vis, visamnesium sounds interesting too. Paul Drew says, let a player who is a spellcaster find this and they do the work of making the mechanical stuff. I mean, they could. I mean, sure. Paul, yes. I mean, absolutely, I would let them have a draft. It is really, you know, here's what it comes down to, right? This kind of player table trust, right? I would certainly let the players have a draft of coming up with the mechanics. If you have players, you know, you play with a lot of folks. Like, like when I would come up with spells, so I don't have any experience playing with this book. I really loved, and I, I need, I want to figure out a way to kind of do more with, I really love the, Ad hoc spell casting from Barbarians of Lemuria. And I did a, you can check, I did a video probably ages ago now where we went through that. I really loved it. And I, I got to play in a game, not for very long. And I played a spell caster and I had a lot of fun coming up with spells. But I think part of me is always looking at it from that GM perspective. So I wasn't like aiming for the moon. You know, I would say like, oh, I could do this. But, you know, I need to have, you know, I, I would do stuff like, oh, I found this bone. And I did a lot of that. Like we're in a cave and, or something and it's like and and the gm's like oh there's like the skeleton of a mouse i'm like ooh, i'll take that skeleton and then i would make a spell how i could do something using the using the the mouse skeleton kind of as a fetish so that i could what, what do they call it uh, like, like uh, i forget the, the term they use for it so i could kind of cast a spell accessing an aspect of the mouse through the fetish but i, I was trying to be pretty balanced right other other players and i I've talked about my stories before with the player I had that tried to do everything in the world with floating disc. If you just said to that player, Oh, just mechanically do it yourself. I have no doubt that one of these spells would encompass every spell and then some that could ever be made and would have the lowest, cheapest cost. Another player will be very circumspect and conservative and really try to match it up. So I would say in terms of giving this to players to figure out the mechanics. Yeah, sure. But I, you know, I would just make sure that expectations are tempered that we would say, Hey, this is a discussion. It's a conversation. So you'll take a stab at it. It's great for me as a GM because that's work. I don't necessarily want to do extra work. So yeah, you take a stab at it and then, but I'm going to need to take a look at it and we'll find some synthesis from wherever you come out in the spell. And then where I come out in the spell, maybe you can meet in the middle. Hey, Magnus. Ah, uh, Yes. Fetish, magic fetish, not that kind of fetish, not a furry style fetish. Brian Smith says, at least the tone of these spells should communicate the possible risk. Like, yeah, maybe your OP spell fails and hell beasts eat your soul. Yeah, I think the, the thing is, Brian Smith, it will be probably the, the what might be the, and I don't think, look, I think the folks who are interested, the audience for this book are likely to have players who are also interested in all these things and not somebody like a, min maxing 5e player who's going to want to min max the heck out of it right try to optimize it in their favor so i don't know these are problems that are really going to come up too much i always just think about them because i've played with a lot of different people and i could see different people i've played with looking at these and <laughs> taking different cracks at them depending but i imagine that the folks who are really into it that their games are probably dialed into the right spot but you know you got to be you got to be aware from it and you know, here on the channel, I, I have no idea who's going to watch this. So people are going to come in from different angles. And and so I, I think it's always good to look at it, not just from, hey, if you use this in the most optimal way, it's going to be great to, well, here are some ways it could possibly go awry, or at least maybe you could avoid them going awry. But I really, I totally like the idea of, of telling the player once they found it, it's like, here, you work it up a little bit and then come back to me and we'll figure it out. I mean, also will make a difference what the, because remember, these are just the spells. We have no spell casting framework for this. So as before, when we looked at whatever spell that was, I was trying to think about it in terms of spell slots because I'm thinking at it from kind of a BX perspective of, or like your, you know, your vanilla D&D &D perspective of having spell slots. So how would a spell slot interact with this system? 
maybe things like duration are based on the spell slot you cast it as something like that, right? No, oh, Sorian says, yeah, Brian, that would work better, but indeed the audience are not power gamers, they're power mechanic heavy types. Yes. Yeah, you just because I could see some people, like I said, I know some players in the I play with in the past who would be like, oh, if it's spell, if it fails, yeah, these horrible things will happen, but then they'll kind of write it so that it will there's no practical chance of it failing. All right, now let's get to cartillary nightmare. Because I got one more finger left after this to get one spell from me, at least one spell from each finger. What I speak of does not exist within any written history or living memory. Rather, it's lack of existence in any such record that raised my suspicions and led to my hypothesis. That is not to say that this is a wild theory floated on fancy and imagination. I am far too old and pragmatic for such follies. Instead, my evidence centers around a collection of 49 histories found in the gated areas of our archive. 42 of them exhibit odd choices in leading and letting and spacing suggesting either poor scribing skills or a stunning theft of ink from the page. Yet, it is the final seven that are most concerning. They are empty, not just blank, but untitled, and with only a score of words at numbers between them. Entire books, books that I penned with my own hand, are left blank with only scattered cryptic sentences. No one, including myself and personal scribes, have any recollection of their content. It's a miracle, I dare say, to have such modern history erased so thoroughly. Opening confession of E., Grzynski, head curator of the Solopsist Archives, executed as a heretic. Paul Drury says, but is high-level magic kind of OP? Uh, I think, well, I, I think yeah, in the D&D system, high-level magic is OP. There is some low-level magic that you can certainly argue in its own way is OP. Certainly, there's a higher tendency for OPness. The OPness? Uh, that's probably a bad way to say it. A higher tendency of there being OP magic the higher level you get. But it doesn't have to be that way. I think being able to cast things more reliably and longer at higher levels is also a way of indicating the power of the wizard. Especially if your spells are going to be kind of all over the place in terms of power, like they are in a book like this, where you can't look at it in some kind of order and say, these are clearly more powerful than those because a lot of them are situational. In some situation, one spell may be really powerful and another is very weak, but then in some other situation, the power level totally shifts. So if your spells are like that, then maybe looking at your spell slots in a different way would work better or your spell caster level, whatever you're using to quantify how, how well you're casting a spell or how much power you're using or ability, whatever. It might be better to look at it. Those in those cases, it's consistency, being able to cast it and it works. And maybe things like how long it lasts, chance of failure is going down, what, whatever it is. So there's different ways to look at it. Magnus said that actually made me laugh out loud. Well, hey, I do what I can. So the actual spell for Cartulary Nightmare, you remove an aspect from the collective memory and history of the world. All right, so that seems really powerful at the face of it. Choose one person, place, or object, and remove a piece of information, such as a relationship, event, etc., from the memory and history of the world. You must painstakingly research the topic, recording all knowledge of the subject into a treaty. The writing alone takes one week. That seems, doesn't seem like a lot for what you're asking, but say sure. The writing alone takes one week and ream of paper for, oh, okay, for, here it goes. Now this sounds better. The writing alone takes one week and, and ream of paper for every 100 people who know the topic. You have no d- idea how long it will take, only when you are done. Only then, finally, you put your sigil on the possibly huge book and cast a spell. The truth and effects of the spell are not removed from existence, but the world conveniently forgets the information and any previous writing on the topic is rendered as a blank space. Destroying the book or the sigil counters and reverses the effect of the spell, restoring memories and writings. Until then, reading the book will be a loss of time. It's knowledge inaccessible. It's readers ignorant. Whew. All right. Again, super cool. Situationally, extremely powerful. And this would also work really well as an NPC spell or something that's been done in the past. But for because for a player, you're gonna need a lot of downtime. I mean, unless you're finding something that literally is virtually unknown, if you have to spend a week and a ream of paper for every hundred people who know something, if it's something that that is not even that well known, you're probably gonna be writing for a while, and you don't know. You can't just say, "Oh, I need a month of downtime because I'm gonna write out this tome," and then I'm gonna no. 
you're just, you're not going to know until you're doing it. You could argue potentially it's not said here. Probably up to GM discussion over if you could need to do it all at once in just one big stretch and you can't stop till you're done, or if you can do it piecemeal. But if you have something that's really rarely known, only a few people know it, really cool. And like I said, for an NPC, that's part of a campaign thing where you're trying to figure out something and you're running into like in the like in the flavor paragraph up here you're running into some text about big blanks and you're trying to figure it out It'd be really cool and then i could i could see a really neat moment where you come into someone's library and they have all these huge books on their shelf and you figure out you know you maybe you cast a tech magic or something similar and you can see them all lighting up and you realize you destroy them it's only this knowledge is re-remembered by the world really cool stuff xander says how i was recommended this with 11 people watching well, I don't know, Xander, with a Z. Clearly, clearly you're part of the few and the proud, assuming you stick around. Magnus says, break into the owl spirit from Avatar's library and either destroy or restore some lost knowledge. Pretty much. Brian Smith says, this is a good spell for a monastery leader to know how all your monks write and write for gener <laughs> generations. But I think you have to cast this, uh, Brian Smith, the, I don't think that would work unless you're having the you're having the uh, the monks cast the spells because if I think you have to write it yourself. You can't have underlings write it and you just cast the spell. Yeah, you know, uh, just just because I don't have a just because I just because uh, I don't have a lot of folks. We are few, but we are proud and mighty. Xander with a Z, let let you not be misled by the fact that we are small in number. What was the what was that guy? I was just watching Crawl the other night, and uh, Crawl holds up, by the way. And it hurts me that I found out that J.J. Abrams is going to be apparently helming a remake because he's gonna it's gonna screw it up. But uh, I always love the what was his Ergo the Magnificent, and he has his little rant at the beginning: small in stature, tall in knowledge, something like that. Quality versus quality, exactly, Paul. Yeah, that's right. And I'm all about quality. Well, I suppose uh, some might argue quantity. You know, I realized the other day I should probably celebrate this. I don't know if I should celebrate it or go hide in a hole, but I think this includes shorts and stuff. I have over a thousand videos on YouTube. A thousand? <laughs> what, is, what, is, what is wrong with me? I don't know how I got there. I don't know how I got to a thousand, but, but I'm there. Most of them forgotten, <laughs> little watched, little watched and less remembered. But there are a thousand videos. I don't know how many hours that is. I mean, these streams usually go an hour. I'm in an hour at an hour right now. So I just in streams. I don't know how many of those have done, but I'm getting to the point where you could just start watching my earliest videos. And then uh, you might not be done till you're dead, especially if you watch them nonstop. Don't don't do that. Take breaks evacuate your bowels, eat, sleep. All right, where are we on fingers? I got one more finger left. Galabdalon. Galabdalon? Galabdalon? All right, so I'm going to read the names. You guys in the chat, figure out which one you want to read for our last spell here. So we've got Galabdalon, Popolote, or Popolote, Osculance, that sounds pretty cool. Uh, Carcamore. L lickoscope, lichoscope, <laughs> lickoscope. Don't lick the scope, boy. Damn it, Bobby. Phy phylodicate. Oh, here we're in paraphernalia. Okay, I do want to do, and oh, and, and Magdalenity. Any of those sound good? First first one that hits the chat, I will read. So, whoops, Matt, I'll, I'll reread these. Magdalenity, Philodicate, Lichoscope, Carcamore, Osculance, Popolote, and Galabdalon. Well, you can see them on the screen, Brian Smith, so you don't need to remember or spell any of them. Just, all right, Carcamore, sold. Spelled it wrong, but you got the idea across. All right, let's read the text, the, the, the flavor stuff first. A station employee, yes. I would help people with their things. 
help them look for lost belongings. I found quite some satisfaction in it. The most important things to people I've found are things that carry a piece of, uh, I'm, I'm sorry, I was going to say something, but the rest of the story leaves it in poor taste. Anyway, on a winter evening, snow falling, I saw a traveler looking around, panicked. I asked whether I could help with anything. The traveler looked at me wildly and, taking a break from paint, panting, said, my friend, luggage. Eventually, we found it. This friend of his had put it between two benches. I bid him goodbye, but as I saw him leaving alone, I noticed a trail of red drops snaking over the platform stones. I wondered nervously whether he had misspoken at all. Bum, bum, bum. <laughs> oh, Brian's not watching. He's only listening. All right, well, keep on crafting, Brian, and post your results in the, in the forums when you have a chance. So this one says, or this spell says, to cast a spell, you must touch a victim and a vessel bearing your sigil. The victim must save or be liquefied. <laughs> Sorry. Uh, this victim must save or be liquefied, the spell forcing them inside the vessel. The vessel must be no smaller than a suitcase, no larger than a wardrobe. So long as the vessel remains closed, the victim is alive and conscious, not in pain, and their condition stable if they were severely wounded, ill, or dying. They can somehow sense, but not speak. If something destroys the sigil or breaches the container, the victim is freed and returns to its previous state. Okay. So, really another interesting, clever, potential, potentially clever spell. You, uh, you have to have a container. Can't be tiny. Can't be a little vial. It's got to be the size of a suitcase, up to a wardrobe in size. I don't know why you'd want something as large as a wardrobe, but hey, you use what you have on hand. It's got to have your sigil on it. Touch the victim, say the spell, they make a save, and if they fail to save, they're liquefied and placed inside the vessel. Sounds pretty cruel. However, if this was someone who was dying, they won't die while they're in there. They're, I, I guess, in a state of suspended animation, except that they can, they can't speak, but they can sense things. So they're still aware of their surroundings, but they're still stuck. Then, if your sigil is destroyed or the container is breached, they're free. I could see some really cool applications of this, almost again as a plot device. Something in the house. They're in a chest. I mean, imagine a chest in a in a in a dungeon or something. But inside, it's you crack the chest. You sense magic on it. Maybe you think, "Ooh, there's an item." Instead, some creature was bound inside there. Maybe, maybe from its own will because it was hurt and, and had to, or because it was just, because you could use it as a spell, basically trap somebody. Can't kill them, but you can trap them in there. And they're freed. Lots of fun, lots of fun things to do with that one. And just a, a you know, a single, single spell, but you gotta, or a single save, but you have to be able to be touching the victim, touching the container and speaking the spell. So, and it's a suitcase or larger. So you can't, hard to stealth it, though you probably could if you could figure it away. Xander with a Z says, you could be a big game hunter, whereas instead of trophies and skulls, you have vats of liquid animals. I suppose, though, I guess a vat would work. If a vat were large enough, it probably would work, but, and that might not even be bad. Depends whether in the uh, trophy, big game hunter sense, you probably want to display them so you could see what's inside, which would be creepy, but kind of cool. Or do you want to be stealthy and use it to kind of hide somebody that either you can't kill or don't want to kill. Either way. And the creepy thing is, there still can sense. So any kind of animal or person you throw in these things is not frozen in time. They're watching. They're just waiting. Paul says that is Mazarian, Mazarian stuff. Indeed it is. All right. I'm at the hour, but I do want to get uh, at least one thing of paraphernalia in here because we have it. We have shards of gob. So let's say something else. Are they all shards of gob? So we have, okay, paraphernalia uses. Okay, so shards of gob. I'll, I guess I'll just read a little bit of this. Where the hand touches, its taint remains, staining the land and the souls dwelling there. Often the corruption manifests as an object, a trinket, a trinket of sorts, acting as both tether and focus for gob's influence. These objects may be found in all places of pilgrimage for those bound by fate or by choice to the horrors and tragedies of the world. Sitting in the center of haunted places, hidden behind the cracked mortar of asylum walls, set into stone alcoves as idols of profane worship. Those who bear these objects are not necessarily sorcerers. 
However, those who do know how to set how to tap the energies of Gob are capable of unleashing wondrous and awful power. Paraphernalia are an effective way to approach Gob, acting as peculiar random loot or as specifically placed set pieces. They may be in possession of a sorcerer like a cultist of Gob, or found as castoffs in discarded piles of rubbish or abandoned in that attic. However, they have the uncanny quality of drawing the attention of both inquisitive minds and power-hungry individuals. It is law that like attracts like. So Gob paraphernalia attracts similar forces. The owner will slowly encounter magic, monsters, and other objects related to the same finger. Oh, that's interesting. The following paraphernalia are a sample collection of minor magical items, each connecting to one of the seven fingers of Gob. Many of them are capable of minor effects on their own. However, a sorcerer can empower them to unlock more diverse and bizarre possibilities. To empower an item, the sorcerer channels the energy of one of their spells into the item. The spell will be spent as if it were cast, but instead of having its normal effect, the item's power powers will manifest. All right, cool and cool. Okay, so let's. I'm just gonna read one. Okay, so they go back to the fingers. Oh, nice. Let's read a nod paraphernalia. A jar labeled "Arm Sunderschmaltz," fat rendered from the corpse of a hanged criminal. Soothes and warms all aches and pains, but one gets the inexplicable feeling of being watched when the jar is open. Nice. I, I, I'm curious. I guess they don't say what the empowering is or what would how what empowering that would do. Soothes and warms all aches and pains. Would you give that a healing effect or would it just be atmospheric? Unknown. Let me see what else. Oh, then we have some catastrophes. All right. So let me read one more catastrophe. I'll read this one. This is an absence paraphernalia. Aquavita. Brewed from liquid memories and of an exquisite vintage, it tastes foul yet familiar. After empowering the bottle, when you share this wine with someone, you can tap into their memories to browse and read them. They can do the same to you, but what are the chances they are aware of this? Oh, interesting. So it'd be curious to know how you... So empowering it, empowering it allows you to have that effect. But then how do you trigger it? I'm going to do something dream. Maybe maybe do dreams or something. <laughs> Brian Smith, I love that show. It says, I love that show, American Idol of Profane Worship. Yeah, pretty much. And then we got some catastrophes. I'm just going to read a random one, a teary catastrophe. The sorcerer's spine crawls out of their body and spends all its time riding on people's backs under their clothes and stealing their joy. Wow, that's a, what, a, what, a, what a buzzkill. The sorcerer no ha now has the posture of a burlap sack, but is still able to cast spells. If the spine can be beaten into submission, <laughs> it will restore the sorcerer's shape and mobility by sliding back to in, in its proper place. Tamed, the spine will now go on escapades only a few nights a week. Well, isn't that nice? And then maybe one more. A general catastrophe. Time contracts within the region, causing all matter within to age 1d20 years over a few seconds. All will ruin, rot, and rust. Thick layer of dust and decay covering everything. And that's a general catastrophe. And we got some more of those. And we have monsters. All right, let me read one monster. Here we go. The Prurigorgon. Prurigorgon. A heaving, groaning, pustulant thing. Its flesh squirming with insects. The skin of the Prurigorgon is riddled with seeping holes and black pits and deep black pits acting as rudimentary eyes. It crawls toward the light gurgling and droning a sing-song language to itself. Super creepy. It's 3 HD. Armor is leather. Uh, it says welting. I don't know. Maybe it's draw. I don't know. No. As armor as leather welting? I'm not, I'm not sure what the welting part means there. So what does it want? It wants to infest. What does it want? It wants to infest living things, to consume light sources, regardless of the pain that might inflict on it. To at last see clearly a feat it can never achieve. And then the means by which it does this, each round, anyone who sees a Purigorgon must save or, f or free one of their hands and scratch their own inordinately welting skin. Oh, I see welting maybe is its power. I'm not sure. Uh, let's see, dealing 1d4 damage to themselves. When rolling maximum damage for some welts burst and spawn swarms of... Either flies, hornets, mosquitoes, beetles, crickets, or ant lions. Ooh. Anything killed by welting has a one in six chance of becoming a Purigorgon, unless the corpse is incinerated or at least kept clear of insects. That's interesting. 
There are some omens attached to this. I guess omens are kind of signs that it's around. Low droning or buzzing, faint itching, rancid sweet smell of rotting fruit and meat, destroyed light sources, welt ridden corpses with blooded fingernails. Fingernails. Oh, this is really cool. I have to integrate this. I kind of like this for monsters. If you need to look for signs that a monster is around, check that out. And then something called Emperor Maggot. The insects cannot escape unless the watcher scratches. Force a watcher to stare at the Pura Gorgon for a full day without scratching as the insects within, insects within fight and eat one another. The largest and strongest will prevail, finally chewing its way out of the chest. <laughs> the Emperor Maggot. All right, so you probably are not going to do this to your friend. I'm not. I'm guessing that the whoever that this person is is not surviving the Emperor Maggot basically chest bursting it. The Emperor Maggot is a bloated larva the size of a human thigh. Its face an insectile parody of its host. The maggot can be eaten raw to add the watcher's remaining years of life to one's own. Oh, gross. If left alive, the maggot will find a place to pupate, and in a year it will shed its cocoon and metamorphosize, metamorphize into an adult clone of the original victim, at last free of any diseases and ailments that previously had and with all memories intact. Oh, boy. Well, on the one hand, you could see why you might want to do this. If you were suffering some horrible conditions that, let's say, only a wish spell or something else could cure, you could try to find this, one of these Pura Gorgons, and stare at it for a day while not itching. I don't know if you would just let them do it, or if you, I suppose you could have your friends tie you up, presuming that they made their saves, or they were blindfolded, or however you could figure out a way to make this happen. You could try to make it happen. Of course, someone could eat that maggot, as disgusting as that sound, and just get I don't know what your remaining years are, but if you're an elf or something, it might be <laughs> might be a lot. Uh, you might might be great human to do this to an elf and then eat it. That, that could be a, a good villain plot, right? This guy wants immortality and he's doing it by kidnapping elves and creating these emperor maggots and then eating them to keep adding thousands of years to their lifespan. But they always want more. Take that idea. That's a good one. On the flip side, maybe they're horribly damaged, and so they're trying to get them and their allies to do it themselves. It takes a year, but if you're, you know, big bad evil guy or some such, a year's maybe worth it. Assuming you, you know, you wouldn't die. Very cool, very creepy, and I, I'm sure that gives us a good idea of what other monsters of Gob would be. And if there's anything else, and they all have, then some of them are different, are gen gen general, and then for different fingers, also very cool. All right, so then we have an adventure hooks. I will just read one. Let's see which one's good. The whole story. Some people just can't let a good magic trick rest without explanation. Mr. Fenister is just such a man. When he saw the Lamarco sisters perform their act on stage, he was astounded, mesmerized even. He was spellbound as they revealed their taunt midriffs, only to feel both repelled and enraptured as cavernous holes opened up, each, uh, opened up upon each sister's belly. He could not believe that they were able to pass objects and even live rabbits through one sister's hole and have it emerge from her sibling, sibling's miraculous aperture. That the objects and the rabbits as well emerged covered in effluvia was no matter. <laughs> Mr. Fenister was willing to pay anyone willing and able to obtain the secret of this trick by force, coercion, or otherwise from the Lamarco sisters. In truth, both sisters have mastered the fistula spell and used it as part of their stage act. So there you go. So you have a cool idea. And notice that kind of like in a lot of the weird fiction through which this gets from, that these come from the, you get the, the context can be kind of more old timey, at least from our standpoint to sort of fantastic and maybe even science fictional. We didn't read them all, but a lot of weird fiction. Like I, when I was reading a lot of the Clark Ashton Smith stories, a fair number of them take place on Venus or in spaceships. They don't call them spaceships. What do they call them? They had different names for it. Like, but whatever. So you can see here, great for, great for any kind of time period. And I like that it connects to one of the spells and one of the fingers and whatnot. And then we have, oh, here we go. Some rules for sorcery. Whew, all right, this is it. Rules for sorcery. Here are a few simple rules to use spells without levels. If you prefer to use traditional spell slots, ignore these rules and let sorcerers prespell, prepare any spell without level using any level spell slot. For a more extensive treatment of spells without levels and more spells, items, and catastrophes, consult Wonder and Wickedness and Marvels and Malazan. So there you go, Paul. So if you want more of this, definitely those books are where you want to find it. Paul, you're welcome for the video. I am going to read this part. I kind of wish they put this up front. 
I feel like this would have maybe answered some questions or given some context, but maybe they just wanted the the, the spells to stand on their on their own, and so they wanted this more as an appendix. I, that's probably what it is. So learning spells. Sorcerers begin their nefarious career knowing three spells. They can find more spells in books or in more lugubrious places. To learn a new spell, spend a week studying it and make an intelligence check. In case of a failure, the spell is beyond the sorcerer's mental capacity. To cast spells, so, you're, that, so that's learning spells, casting spells. Sorcerers learn to cast spells in one of two ways, depending on their ancestors, traditions, or teacher. There's rote memorization, in which case each spellcaster prepares spells daily before adventuring, allocating one spell slot per character level, and can then cast the each allocated spell once. It is possible and common to allocate more than one slot to the same spell to be able to cast it more than once. And then the other version is spontaneous. Each spellcaster can cast one spell per character level per day, but can't cast the same spell twice in a day. Brian Smith says, Fistulas are, pos are popular in any era. Indeed, Brian. Now for the spell duration. So this one was one that came up in a couple of the spells. Spell duration can be one of these three types. One is timed. The effect lasts one exploration term, typically 10 minutes per level, and then reverts to normality. A second type is instantaneous. The magic happens instant, instantly, but its effects persist even after the casting is finished. And finally, sigil. The spell requires the sorcerer to apply their sigil on the target, taking one expiration turn. The spell lasting while the sigil is extant. A sorcerer can have only one sigil of a given spell at a time. Drawing a second sigil for the same spell voids the first, causing it to crumble into useless ash and terminates the first spell. Sigils are personal and recognizable in the same way a person laughs or cries. All right, so that, that's kind of a really important one. Because all those spells that had sigils, you couldn't just keep casting them. And in fact, it would seem that of all the spells that have sigils to them, you can only have one active at a time. Because as soon as you cast a spell and have to do another sigil, the first spell, regardless of what it is, fails. So all those spells that we saw, oh, put your sigil and do this, put your sigil and do that, sigil and do that. Only one of those could be active at any one time, because as soon as you go to do another sigil for the other spell, the first one drops. It might, it might be interesting to tie that to spell catcher level also, in terms of how many sigils you could have active, and then you can either roll dice or do oldest sigil first fails. The rolling dice might be a lot of fun. Or use some other like a random generator, because you don't know which one's going to fail if you want to, you know... Push your luck. You know that you have some of these sigil spells out there that aren't that big of a deal, but one of them's really bad if it fails. But you need to do another one. So do you take a chance? No, Sorian says that they'll be recommending this book to their brother. It's more of his narrative style, and he's been interested in non-leveled spells for old-school games. He likes wild magic. I don't. Yep, I think it's definitely a good fit for that kind of person or someone with those tastes. Whence catastrophes? Sorcerers can ignore every single sorcery rule limitation, including exceeding their daily spell casting quota and cast spells they have not properly learned. Doing so, however, doing so, however, invites catastrophe. So that's how we can get catastrophes. Sorcery does not come with a reliable list of what works and what does not. However, when sorcerers engage in risky behavior, there should be a discussion between the referee and other players about what kind of roles and costs are necessary and roughly what catastrophic consequences a failure would entail. Here are examples of the kind of risky behavior leading to catastrophes. Casting spells without learning them first. Casting spells beyond normal allotment. Spell casting interruption. Non-sorcerers casting spells. Sorcerer dying during casting. Curses including using a cursed item. Feel free to add your own. I mean, it's a really important point because if you're going to let sorcerers go beyond their means and what might be really cool in the kind of campaign is that anyone can cast spells, but there's that catastrophe cost. The catastrophes are not just the magic user, right? It's not just the sorcerer. It's potentially something affecting the world, affecting the rest of the party. You don't want to have somebody go rogue and go off and do stuff if you haven't really agreed to what the parameters are. Because it'd be very easy. I mean, look, it can always happen, and some of those make the best stories. Every time the, a wizard casts a fireball and incinerates themselves in their own party, you know, an angel gets their wings. Great, but if, if that's something that's continually happening, or if the party's not really down with that, or if it's even worse than that in a way, then you don't want someone to just be unleashing that stuff because they are in there for their little personal bit of joy, which is just going berserk, but that's kind of ruining for everybody else. So cover your bases, figure out your parameters. In case of possible catastrophe, we recommend in most cases to make some of the spell happen, but at a price. However terrible that might be. 
again, we provide some suggestions. So here I have a couple suggestions. In any case, start rolling a charisma check as a bare minimum. Do fate and the gods let a mortal meddle with reality in these difficult and dubious circumstances? In case of failure, a catastrophe strikes the sorcerer. If the spell does not is not learnt properly, the sorcerer could need an intelligence check to control it, so to avoid mistargeting the spell or corrupting its effects. If the sorcerer casts a spell when they are out of their daily allotment, they suffer 1d6 temporary damage to a random attribute. Then a wisdom check might be needed to avoid being overwhelmed and stunned by the winds of magic for 1d6 hours. So there are some suggestions. And then we got the index and a colophon. Whew. All right, so this is a really fun I could, a book. I can see why a lot of people like it. I think, you know, no Soren sort of hinted at it, and I kind of mentioned it before, is it is going to be somewhat how much you get out of it, how much you enjoy it, how much work it's going to take to integrate it with your game is really going to depend on the type of game you want. Paul Drew mentioned, you know, gamers for narrativists and those t- those labels, some people like them, some people don't, whatever. But really, the type of game you run, the type of table you run, type of group you have, type of players you have, type of GM you are, all that stuff is going to really affect how well these spells work for you. Do you like playing fast and loose with magic that's kind of crazy and dangerous? Powerful, but very situational, right? There, there was no spells I saw here, and granted, I didn't read them all. I have to go back and read them, but you're not seeing a spell fireball just does a th- does a thing they're always interesting they always have some kind of quirk to them puts a little bit of that creepiness back into magic that weirdness strangeness that sometimes magic loses i think you know like, that kind of i don't want to i always seem like i'm picking on harry potter but kind of that sort of harry potterization or probably even modern dndization of spells is that they they become very ordinary they're just they some of that kind of weirdness is gone. That's why I always love the summon spell from Lamentations of the Flame Princess. It's just, it's crazy. And it just, it embraces its craziness. This is the same way. It's trying to be weird. It's trying to be strange and it's embracing it and going with it. And if that works for you, great. If you're going to be someone who has players or you yourself really need to figure out the way things work, then that stuff at the back will help, but there'll probably be more reading you have to do. And depending on what, framework you're using if you're not using kind of a fast and free sorcery system like this book has then you're going to have more uh, more things you're going to want to straighten out and if again if you have players that are apt to abuse open-ended type stuff then you know be aware but in terms of flavor the descriptions the effects all really fantastic stuff the book is very well laid out the physical book awfully nice as well like I mentioned at the start, I'll, I'll put the link in the show notes. I think I got it from Lost Pages directly. It's listed on Exalted Funeral, but it's out of stock that I saw. I don't know if it's a permanent out of stock issue or whether they're going to be getting more in stock if you like to order from Exalted Funeral. I don't know, but it was out of stock when I looked at it originally a couple of weeks ago. And then when I looked at it a little bit later when I bought it, or when I, when I looked at it a little, when I, when I first looked at it a couple of weeks ago, out of stock. When I came back to it a couple of days later, still has stock, and then I am finding out lost pages. When I checked it yesterday or this morning, whatever, where's my brain? Also out of stock. So I don't know, but they were in stock on lost pages. So you still get it. You get the PDF, which I've been showing on screen, you get the book. And then I think you have a download to a soundtrack, which I will have to check out separately. Um, but really cool stuff. So appreciate all the folks who over time have recommended that i check this out definitely inspirational if you want to really you're really unhappy you just feel like really monkeying with your magic system and you want to try something different check it out there are another couple books and i guess that sort of make a series with this i will have to look those up as well i would always recommend if you're interested in kind of ad hoc magic it's not the same as this but it's different and i also like it a lot check out barbarians the barbarians of lemuria and i also did a video on that you can look it up on the show note or the the channel hope you guys dug it i dug it a lot that's all i got for now folks um enjoy the rest of your day night whenever you end up watching or listening to this game on everybody and i will talk to you later bye now